Hi, so hello. good. Hello. How are you? Good, good, good. Uh, I just got email from Javian asking for. Uh, uh-huh. But it, it, I guess if you can try to uh, share your screen and if it works, then it's, it will not be completely necessary to send us the slide. Uh, well, I'll probably send copy later anyway, but let me try mm-hmm. to this move stuff. Um, okay, let's try this. Does it work? <laughs> yes. So, bro, I'll go of it. So, okay. Hello. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll stop sharing for now then. You can share the slide. Uh, you can sh- show the slides if you want. Mm. I'm sure people oh. love to see it. <laughs> well, I, I think they'll have enough time to see lots of other slides. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, I can send you. Maybe a copy. No, it's okay. I'll I'll do it later. Oh, I just realized something. So this is the building where I started my physics study. That's correct. So how many languages do you speak by now, Jovian? <laughs> no, no, other than Chinese, Mandarin, Taiwanese, English, and maybe some German. I'm trying to learn Russian. Oh my gosh, wow. That's um, already way, way more than I know. <clears throat> I do try to learn a bit of something, but not uh, good enough. But I think there are two different questions. So one can also ask in how many languages you can make an introduction. <laughs> I can make <laughs> Russian introduction if you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've seen you given introductions in all kinds of languages in this uh, series. So the total so, number is probably 50. I don't know. Hmm. Jun, do you want to make the introduction in Russian? <laughs> I can say a few sentences and then maybe later you introduce more seriously. Yeah, okay. So, Actually, I don't uh, need serious introductions, so it's <laughs> don't take it too seriously. Okay, Jun, please go ahead. <laughs> oh, let's record first. And uh, Sergey, do you want to share the screen, please? Oh, okay, I'll try to do that again. Okay. Maybe we should start. Mm-hmm. Oh, welcome. Welcome, everyone. The Blah Blah Jolovit. Welcome to Harvard CMSA seminar. The Blah Blah Jolovit, now seminar V, Harvard CMSA. Today, we are very honored to uh, have Professor Sergei Kuko to speak. Daniela Bajoyeshist, Figure Sit, Sedonia, this to be Professor Sergei Kukova. And uh, Dupe will introduce more about Sergei. Uh, do please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jovan, for uh, the uh, informal introduction. So today we are 
glad to have Sergey uh, from Caltech who will tell us about exotic new animals in the CFT zoo, quasi particles, and anisotropic scaling. So please, Sergey. Well, thank you very much, guys. Uh, thank you, Julian, for this uh, very nostalgic <laughs> feeling you bring to uh, me and uh, perhaps many other speakers. Um, yeah, so thank you. It's good to be uh, back in Harvard, uh, even virtually, and um, see many familiar faces and friends. So um, uh, also, I think that uh, what I'm going to tell you fits reasonably well in this uh, seminar series because uh, it's supposed to be part of a program on math and physics. And uh, you'll see that, indeed, what I'm going to tell you combines uh, math and physics. So let me start with uh, some motivation and proper context, uh, which will be context for the entire talk. And <clears throat> I want you to think about um, Ising model. And um, there'll be many, many generalizations of uh, this setup uh, through the rest of the talk. And um, if you put um, Ising model, which at critical point is described by a CFT in the magnetic field, uh, then it breaks some of the symmetries. For example, it breaks uh, Z2 symmetry by coupling to magnetization, the spin density sigma, but it actually preserves a lot of uh, other symmetries of conformal field theory. And the result is surprisingly integrable quantum field theory. So this uh, line of development uh, started in uh, late 70s and then was extremely active uh, throughout um, 80s. So in particular, uh, this kind of problem that I just described uh, was solved in a famous paper by Zamolodzikov. And of course, there are many others who contributed to it. And uh, what it connects is, on the one hand, a critical system described by conformal field theory, namely the Ising model, and a massive quantum field theory, which has some of the infinite symmetries of, of the conformal field theory, the uh, QFT in this case, uh, perturbed by uh, Ising model, perturbed by magnetic field, which is uh, in CFT language, this um, field phi with uh, conformal scaling dimensions, uh, 1 16th on left and right. So how do you see uh, symmetries in the massive theory in the integrable regime? Well, uh, massive theory has uh, massive particles and uh, they can be of various kinds. They can be, for example, solitons uh, and kinks uh, such as in sine Gordon model, or they can be uh, fermions uh, in the theory description. But either way, you have uh, something massive. And um, usually, you write um, energy and momentum of such particles <clears throat> in terms of rapidity variable theta. And uh, you may try to scatter these particles. Um, so what's special, and one way you can see integrability in uh, this massive regime and a deformed CFT is by noticing that scattering processes factorize in uh, purely two into two scatterings. And um, such processes are therefore purely elastic scattering. So that's the feature uh, and the consequence of uh, this large symmetry that is preserved. So in the rest of the talk, I'll try to um, describe to you various systems. And I want you to keep this example in mind because uh, again, there will be many parallels with this example. In some sense, it will be prototype for many things that will happen. So uh, first of all, we'll consider many generalizations of Ising model. <clears throat> also, we'll put systems in external fields. So just like magnetic field here, although external fields or deformations that we'll consider will be a little bit more exotic. And that's uh, part of the name exotic in the title. And um, we'll also look, and that's probably the most interesting part, for symmetries of the system. So the symmetries that will be relevant for us, both preserved and broken, will also be very exotic. So there are lots of exotic things that's going to happen. Wait, excuse me, Sergey. Yeah. Are, are the scattering objects necessary uh, particle or quasi-particle like here? That's right. So um, these uh, objects that um, are scattered um, are usually called quasi-particles. And that's um, the name in the title that I'll use very broadly. 
but basically quasi particle to me will refer to to such objects uh, which have elastic uh, scattering metrics yeah that's right okay. so one uh, yeah, yeah but in, in in this model you know this notion of uh you know uh, i mean elastic scattering refers to original field as well right i mean so so in this way you have soliton but you have no i don't know I wonder, you wouldn't call it uh, quasi particles, right? It's just original particles of the sea. Like I say, I, I'll use notion of quasi particle more broadly, uh, and, and you'll see from uh, the rest of the talk why. So, uh -huh. uh, in particular, a quasi particle will be any object that has this factorizable S matrix. And again, of course, intuitively, I want that to represent symmetries of this theory, but you'll see later in the talk in what sense uh, I'm referring to the symmetries. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <clears throat> so maybe uh, beginning of um, this um, um, story or, or uh, when we talk about symmetries is uh, the following uh, neat observation. So first of all, uh, this um, a lot of purely elastic scattering described by two by two scattering metrics depends only on difference of rapidities. So these are usually abbreviated as theta one, two and so on. And um, because again, it's factorizable, it satisfies the Young-Buxter equation. So written here in the bottom of the slide. Uh, but another interesting point I want to make, um, and uh, this will be relevant for some things that I'll describe later. And also I want you to keep in mind as a context, is that um, if you take the limit where rapidity goes to either plus infinity or minus infinity, this kind of extreme limits, then what you get is in many systems, you find R matrix of some quantum group. So that's again, uh, something that I want you to keep in mind as a context for uh, much of um, what's gonna happen in the rest of this talk. So this has been this program has been very successful and uh, it has been studied throughout um, 80s and even continued in early 90s with great success, especially for rational conformal field theories, where one finds beautiful connections between conformal critical uh, field theories and uh, there are massive deformations which nevertheless are integrable. So I hope many of you are familiar with uh, CFT Zoo which was uh, skillfully tamed by Greg and Nutty in late 90s, in late 80s. <clears throat> and um, their connection with Charles Simon's theory plays an important role and uh, it uh, organizes um, rational CFTs and even provides important lessons for some of the non-rational CFTs uh, in a very clear structure described by its symmetry. Curiously, just as uh, CFT Zoo was tamed uh, around uh, late 80s, early 90s, completely new exotic animals were delivered into the zoo. And uh, I'm speaking of logarithmic conformal field theories, which are kind of strange. So that's why I call them exotic. They don't play by usual rules and uh, they relax some of the axioms and conditions we usually require of a CFT. So from this point of view, logarithmic CFTs should be kind of generic because they relax some of the conditions. But also uh, true members of such logarithmic CFTs are uh, more difficult to study also exactly for this reason that they relax uh, certain conditions. So I'll not describe in a full detail or give you a full definition of logarithmic CFTs. First, it won't be necessary. And uh, also this is the subject that still is being built and explored. So part, that's part of motivation for this talk. But um, I can explain the notion or part of the name logarithmic at least in several different ways. So first um, and most obvious perhaps is that there are logarithms in correlators and correlation functions. So they have logs. There are also logs in representation theory, meaning that uh, Virasor generator L0 is not uh, diagonalizable as we usually want it, but uh, it has Jordan block structure. And finally, uh, there is a third uh, appearance of logarithms, uh, logarithms of Q, uh, modular variable, uh, in modular transformations, which makes uh, modular properties of uh, 
characters of such logarithmic CFTs, not exactly modular in the usual sense, but uh, exhibit they exhibit some exotic types of modularity. So that's perhaps yet another notion of logarithms. So such logarithmic CFTs are always non-unitary. Uh, that uh, would immediately suggest or uh, might suggest that uh, they shouldn't be terribly relevant for physics. Um, in this talk, of course, I'll try to explain um, otherwise uh, as, as history taught us. And also in part because characters of such logarithmic CFTs, as I told you, don't transform very nicely under modular group, uh, constructing modular invariant partition functions, which combine both uh, chiral and anti-chiral sectors, both left and right sectors, is uh, more challenging than in rational CFTs. And as a result, by now there is a lot more literature on chiral part of logarithmic CFT, just the vertex algebra part, um, where one studies, uh, say, holomorphic or anti-holomorphic sector. Uh, but a lot more uh, needs to be done and explored uh, with respect to um, combining these two sectors, namely at the level of full uh, CFT. So this is usually posed as one of the questions in this field. So if you hear talks about logarithmic CFTs, one of the questions that often comes up is uh, to understand or to go from the chiral part to, to the full CFT. And in this talk, I hope to um, motivate the point of view that uh, it's actually a clue. The fact that we have a lot more access to something chiral in logarithmic world rather than full CFT is actually suggesting yet another perspective that I'll try to motivate um, by the end of the talk. So focusing on uh, physics questions and uh, in particular trying to um, speak about this uh, combination of left and right and to the full CFT. Um, one might tackle uh, all kinds of uh, questions such as, for example, RG flows. So this clearly requires discussing the full physical system. And um, again, since uh, these theories are non-unitary, it's not even entirely clear how to phrase uh, such questions and uh, what, what should be the right framework. So um, again, I'll try to, um, by the end of the talk, if there is enough time, uh, reveal a sort of proposal for how one can think about a um, question like this, and it will come from a slightly unusual direction. And in fact, uh, the goal of the talk, uh, perhaps motivated by all of these questions, is um, how shall we think about um, RG flows or massive deformations of um, logarithmic CFTs, are there uh, analogs of um, elastic scattering and so on and so forth. By uh, connecting these questions to interesting new places where logarithmic CFTs show up. So in some sense, the goal of the talk is to describe uh, new connections and uh, new uh, perspectives on, on such uh, logarithmic theories. Uh, mostly focusing on physics. So, yeah. so, Sergey, can I ask you a very naive question? I missed some part. Yeah. So this modular invariance, you didn't mention why is it expected that your partition functions are modular invariant? Like, is there some group of symmetry or gauge symmetry or something like that or that induces this modular invariance? Or? Well, you'll see a little bit more about modularity later in the talk, but um, uh, when one combines left uh, moving sector and right moving sector, holomorphic, anti-holomorphic sector in a full partition function of a two-dimensional conformal field theory, one expects uh, the full partition function to be modular invariant. And uh, in rational CFT, easy way or one way to do it is by knowing how individually characters transform for left sector and right sector. So if you know this information, we can combine them. So oh. if, you, if you don't know modularity, which is closer to the situation here, uh, then mm -hmm. it's, it's more challenging to build a full modular invariant partition. Function. Nice, nice, thanks. Yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt at any point. Um, so there are 
many uh, things that may be relevant to uh, what I'm going to tell you. So here I mention perhaps uh, most relevant three uh, places where, where this uh, new connections or new perspectives on log CFTs uh, will come from. Uh, one is uh, work still in progress with uh, Kolar uh, and uh, two other uh, published papers. One is uh, in collaboration with Miranda Cheng, Sun Bong Chun, Francesca Ferrari, and Sarah Harrison. And uh, the second one is uh, with Ju Poshan, Hiroko Nakajima, and two very good students at Caltech, uh, Sangyuk Park and Nikita Sepenka. So in the second paper, in the title, you see at least uh, something logarithmic. So uh, perhaps connection is um, uh, clearer in the case of the second paper. In the first paper, uh, there is uh, no logarithmic in the title, but um, there is logarithmic already in the abstract. And I'll tell you a little bit more about this work. So you'll uh, see why modularity, uh, which in fact already showed up in our discussion and even some questions will be relevant for understanding logarithmic CFTs. Yeah, but uh, uh, Sergey, uh, the, the adjective logarithmic refers to the node or refers to the theory? Uh, yeah, so here, uh, hold on this question. Uh, he, here it refers to, uh, like I said, it's something logarithmic, but it actually has to do with logarithmic CFT. So this not invariance to which it refers are named after logarithmic CFTs. <laughs> so, okay. So it still goes back to, to our main subject, which is um, logarithmic theories. And in some of these papers, you can also find more references on um, other places where logarithmic CFTs show up, show up and um, some introductory papers and, and surveys. So <clears throat> another uh, motivation for the stock, I'm still in the motivation part, uh, comes from recent work um, here by Sangyuk Park, uh, exactly a year ago. So you see it's April, 2020, uh, which is relevant to constructing new uh, three manifold invariants. And uh, here are the, I'm not gonna describe the construction in detail, but the crucial part of the construction is uh, based on our metrics. Uh, which is our matrix for quantum group at generic Q, and uh, it operates with Verma modules at generic complex weights. Uh, the form of the R matrix is written on the bottom of the slide, but it's not perhaps terribly important. I want to uh, emphasize just uh, basic features. Um, as any R matrix, it um, is a map from uh, vector space tensor, uh, another copy to uh, another uh, pair of such spaces, where uh, basis vectors are labeled by i, j, and k. And this basically, uh, in the language of quasi-particles, could be describing types of quasi-particles. However, what's interesting uh, about this uh, particular R matrix, and um, of course, many, there are many other cousins. I'll tell you about some of them later. Um, is that in addition to uh, this uh, states uh, labeled by i, j, and k, and so on, uh, each line, uh, which can be thought of as a world line of such quasi-particle, is assigned uh, a number, in this case, complex uh, number, x or y, that is a complex weight of the Verma module. And a uh, question that I want to pose is, uh, or if, if um, my general motivation is too general, then this is a very concrete specific question that uh, we want to kind of answer. Um, what is a quasi-particle interpretation of this R matrix? Namely, does it arise uh, as um, scattering matrix uh, of some um, integrable deformation of a two-dimensional CFT? Um, and um, again, is, is there a purely two-dimensional uh, quasi-particle interpretation. So it's this variables X and Y which make this question kind of interesting and funny because uh, one might be tempted to think that X and Y should be interpreted as rapidities of, of these particles, but that's not the case. Um, and um, therefore, if rapidity is introduced, then, then this will be yet another variable. So question is, uh, is there an S matrix analogous to the one I showed you 
uh, on previous slides studied by Zamologic, Fedya Smirnov and others, where um, such R metrics can emerge uh, from quasi-particle interpretation. So this is uh, a very concrete question. And again, uh, toward the end of the talk, I'll propose uh, a context where uh, we believe such R metrics appears. And of course, if anyone uh, knows two-dimensional statistical system where uh, this R metrics comes up, that, that would be good to know. Curiously, uh, it's easy to find um, string or supersymmetric Q of T construction of such R metrics. And uh, I'll say a little bit about this um, later in the talk. <clears throat> and also, uh, I want to emphasize that this is a purely uh, physics question because mathematically, the R matrix is already there. So uh, it exists, its quantum group meaning is, is clear. So mathematically, it's a non a question, but a question is purely about uh, two dimensional statistical physics. So, what does it have to do with? Uh, logarithmic anything. Um, in a slightly different uh, line of development, which seems uh, a priori completely different, um, people also studied uh, quantum groups, but in this case, at roots of unity. And uh, here is uh, one of the papers uh, by Murakami in, in this line of development where uh, a different uh, R matrix appears. It's associated to quantum groups at roots of unity and also has uh, some of the properties that um, I mentioned on the previous slide, namely, it also comes with these colors, um, which were denoted by X and Y complex numbers on the previous slide. So if there is any quasi-particle interpretation of this kind of R matrix, it should be such that quasi-particles are attached uh, this complex decorations, uh, colors, X and Y. And um, this, uh, even though this paper that I'm showing on the slide is from early 2000s, this is actually part of a bigger development which started in 1990 um, and uh, continued for, for 30 years. And in the course of uh, this 30 years, uh, this exotic invariants uh, that come up from such R matrices uh, had no connection to Chern Simons theory, uh, no connection to physics which is quite surprising uh, because most of the usual quantum group invariants, and by usual, I mean the ones which play a role in taming the conformal zoo and uh, have connection with rational safety, they of course uh, have a lot of, uh, a lot to do with Chern simons theory. They have a lot to do with string theory realization of Chern simons theory, BPS states and so on. But uh, this more exotic invariants, uh, did not have any single connection and there was no single paper connecting it to physics until uh, 2020. So this was one of the main results uh, in our joint work that I mentioned earlier, namely by uh, studying Coulomb branches of three-dimensional theories. Uh, we showed first of all that uh, both uh, our matrices that I mentioned on previous slides have uh, realization in physics and uh, moreover, uh, if you take one of them, which is define a generic Q and uh, send Q to a root of unity, uh, one of the main results of the paper can be phrased by saying that uh, R matrix uh, in one case becomes R matrix in the other case. So, yeah. uh, I'm sorry, Sergei, but uh, you know, the name Alexander, it's, uh, it's not about the Malochikov, right? It's a different Alexander. Uh, which name, Alexander? Uh, this one? Uh, yeah. Yeah, they, 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 this is from topology. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. thank you. So, that's right. So, invariants on the right side uh, that uh, arise from this R matrix are various generalizations of Alexander polynomial. And there is, um, uh, Q is not a continuous variable in that case, but there is still dependence on uh, this variables X and Y. And, um, on the left-hand side, X and Y are still present and the Q is, is, is a generic parameter. So um, yeah, that's, that's, that's one of the concrete results and uh, one of the interesting new connections between um, uh, various developments, including this uh, logarithmic type of invariance, which um, on the right-hand side already had some connections to um, logarithmic CFTs, namely, 
at, at, at Roots of Unity, uh, in particular by Murakami himself, um, connections to logarithmic conformal field theories were known. So that basically provides uh, a link to log CFT of this entire subject. And um, as I'm finishing this uh, motivation with uh, some specific questions that um, I want to keep in mind for the rest of the talk, um, I want to point out that um, we'll see many different connections of, of logarithmic CFTs or, or aspects that we're going to discuss to many different areas. And um, even in this uh, brief um, kind of motivation or introduction, we already saw several of them. For example, we saw quantum groups and R metrics um, show up um, and um, a little bit of topology. Um, and then I mentioned some supersymmetric theories. So there will be uh, a lot more uh, to see. And um, in fact, this is kind of subject uh, which um, if, if I gave more systematic introduction to, to logarithmic CFTs, we would see in fact, even more of these connections. And um, today I'll focus mostly on the physics side. So some of the math topics will come up and um, they're unavoidable, but my main focus will be again on physics. Uh, and in this context, uh, you'll see also that there are many connections to real physics, namely um, uh, experimental physics, not just lattice model simulation or uh, something like that. <clears throat> but uh, actual experiments. And this is kind of interesting because um, based on non-unitary nature of logarithmic CFTs, uh, you might expect that uh, connections to real physics are rather poor, but this is uh, not the case at all. So in fact, let me start uh, with um, this uh, item, with this bullet point. And uh, all the systems on this slide uh, share uh, one feature in common, namely all of these uh, systems uh, shown on the slide can be described by logarithmic CFTs. Uh, the first two are various generalizations of Ising model and um, you'll see uh, various latest models in this talk. Uh, one of the most famous uh, latest models is uh, uh, Q-state POTS model introduced by POTS in 1952. It's basically a generalization of Ising where uh, a spin is allowed to have Q different values. So in particular, if Q is equal to two, it's the Ising model, but then you can consider uh, this whole family. And naively, if you take Q to one, so that spin takes only one value, you would expect a trivial theory. And indeed uh, in this uh, family of critical phenomena, central charge uh, goes to zero and partition function becomes one, but the theory does not become trivial, rather it becomes uh, logarithmic. Another generalization of Ising model is where uh, spins um, are allowed to take values on a sphere and this theory has ON symmetry, so-called ON model. And if N is equal to one, then again, it's Ising because uh, O1 is basically a group of plus one and minus one signs. But uh, if you take N to zero, um, you, again, don't get a trivial system, but rather you get um, logarithmic CFT, which in this case uh, describes a self-avoiding walk. And in the previous example, it's relevant to percolation. There are various other applications uh, of logarithmic CFTs, for example, to quantum hole plateau phase transitions, to dynamical systems such as um, some pile models and so on. And, um, um, this shows that uh, they, they do have uh, something to do with uh, real physics and uh, in particular statistical physics and condensed matter physics. And uh, here is an example of a very nice uh, use of um, uh, logarithmic CFT in the context of percolation that I mentioned on the previous slide uh, by John Cardi where uh, using this connection, he predicted the probability of a um, horizontal crossing from one side to another side in uh, a percolation uh, system. And also uh, here shown in the bottom is uh, a prediction for a constant C that describes the density of clusters of a certain area. So in this percolation problem, it's uh, expected that 
the density of such cluster should go as some constant divided by the area and the value of this constant uh, predicted by connection with logarithmic CFT is in great um, agreement with uh, experimental measurements, which uh, is a very beautiful application of, of this. Interestingly, um, when Cardi made this prediction, uh, not so many logarithmic CFTs uh, were known. And um, like I mentioned before, this is the subject that uh, is still growing, that uh, is still in development. But uh, let me tell you uh, first few members uh, or perhaps most popular members of uh, this exotic family of, of um, logarithmic theories. So if you try to search for them, you'll probably find uh, these uh, three uh, candidates that go by the name symplectic fermions, uh, triplet and singlet logarithmic theories. So symplectic fermions uh, are basically uh, versions of beta gamma system such that a single copy, um, a single uh, pair uh, has central charge minus two. Again, remember that these theories are non-unitary. And if you take D copies, you get basically uh, this generalization parameterized by D. So triplet and singlet uh, logarithmic models labeled by number P uh, are a little bit more interesting. So again, CFT is characterized by its uh, central charge as the most basic quantity. And here I give a central charge for this singlet and triplet uh, theories, which uh, happens to be the same. And on the next slide, I'll describe the relation between them. Uh, but before I do that, I want to point out that uh, some of these families actually overlap. So for instance, if you take a, a triplet one comma P theory and take P equals two, then uh, central charge of this uh, theory will be minus two and that matches the first family if D is equal to one. So in fact, uh, one comma two triplet model uh, is uh, basically uh, the copy of symplectic fermions. Sergei, uh, but uh, this negative, uh, say a central charge, uh, it's in, in correspondence with non-unitarity of a logarithmic theory or it's not related? It is related. It's basically a reflection of non-unitarity. That's okay. exactly what it is. Mm. So um, if you're more familiar with a unitary CFTs, then uh, you probably know theories uh, at the extreme right and extreme left in this chain. So uh, if you take, um, for example, root lattice uh, of um, some um, Lie algebra and rescale it, you can construct the lattice VOA that's on the right. Um, associated to it is a uh, corresponding affine W algebra. And uh, the singlet and triplet theories uh, sit in between. The triplet theory uh, is constructed from a lattice VOA by um, taking a kernel of uh, a short screening operator. So in the lattice VOA, you have a long screening uh, operators and short screening operators corresponding to uh, length of the momentum. And the kernel of the short screening gives you the uh, triplet um, vertex algebra. And it still has uh, action of uh, asymmetry. For example, in the SL2 case that I'm describing, it has SL2. Um, acting and singlet is basically invariant part of that of that SL2. So this construction, uh, which uh, often is called fagin tipunin construction, is analogous to how we construct uh, minimal models by taking cohomology uh, of such screening operators, uh, in particular by Felder and others. And uh, here, instead of taking cohomology, which is uh, kind of more normal operation by taking kernel, you obtain uh, something that's logarithmic rather than uh, rational CFT. So this is um, a brief glimpse into uh, how such uh, logarithmic CFTs can be applied and uh, also constructed. So uh, again, I'm slowly uh, fleshing out some of these connections to vertex algebras um, and um, uh, physics. So um, next I'll describe um, 
uh, connection to uh, three-dimensional theories that uh, I mentioned earlier. And uh, this next bit uh, will involve supersymmetry. So if you like supersymmetry, uh, this will be uh, a particular connection of logarithmic CFTs to supersymmetric world. If you don't like supersymmetry, then um, this short bit uh, will be not too long. Uh, and uh, then I'll come back and discuss non-supersymmetric things. But maybe are there any other questions at, at this point? Okay, so I personally uh, didn't have any specific interest in logarithmic theories. Um, and uh, since they are non-unitary, I didn't pay much attention to the subject. Uh, so this is um, my confession to you uh, for a long time, um, roughly until maybe um, eight years ago, when uh, with Pavel and Apijit, we were studying uh, supersymmetric uh, three-dimensional theories. And uh, for various purposes, in particular, understanding um, high-dimensional uh, theories compactified on three manifolds and four manifolds, uh, we needed to um, study a very particular system, which is uh, such three-dimensional supersymmetric theory with a supersymmetric boundary condition, the chiral. So the chiral boundary condition carries uh, two-dimensional zero comma two supersymmetry. And what we needed is a partition function of the, the system, understanding its physics and, and so on. So surprisingly, uh, such systems were not uh, studied at the time. And in fact, um, we were even more surprised to realize that uh, there is, uh, at least by then, there was no single paper on non-abelian dynamics of uh, two-dimensional zero-two theories, uh, let alone its coupling to three-dimensional bulk. So we basically had to um, develop all these ingredients uh, from scratch. And um, now such systems uh, play an important role uh, in various uh, string and QFT constructions, and there is a rather extensive literature in particular related to the developments that um, I'm going to describe to you. So I want to point out that uh, in this uh, coupled three-dimensional uh, field theory to uh, 2D uh, theory on a boundary, if three-dimensional theory is uh, gapped or gappable, then the partition function that we want to uh, construct is basically elliptic genus of the two-dimensional theory. So in some sense, uh, this partition function is uh, a unique uh, canonical generalization of elliptic genus, which allows to deal with two-dimensional theory, uh, but also coupled to three-dimensional bulk. And here are uh, some of the ingredients of this uh, elliptic genus of the combined system are now called uh, half index in the literature. If you have a Fermi multiplet uh, in two dimensions, which is uh, basically a while uh, complex fermion, then its contribution to elliptic genus uh, is given by theta function, written here as a product of two Q uh, Pohymer symbols. And it's easy to um, see which um, particular states contribute to uh, uh, which factors in, in this uh, theta function in this elliptic genus. And uh, also it's easy to describe a connection or a contribution of a three-dimensional n equals to chiral multiplet, which basically uh, provides with a Dirichlet boundary condition, a half of this formula. So um, therefore I'll describe both two-dimensional contributions and three-dimensional contributions in parallel. Wait, yes, Arkady. Uh, I'm just a little bit backward. Uh, you know, in this construction, you know, uh, I wonder, uh, is, this con uh, is this kind of uh, going to 3D? It, it's not that uh, the 3D theory would be holographic in certain sense uh, because uh, of this connection with 2D or uh, yeah, or again, maybe it doesn't make sense what, uh, what I'm asking. You see about holography. Well, actually that's a, an extremely good question and it makes uh, a lot of sense. Uh, 
Although here, what I'm doing is I'm starting starting with the 3D. So uh, you, you, yeah, you, you'll see this. It's a, it's a very good question, which will come up, um, come back to us in a few minutes. So here, I'm not starting with any holography. Uh, it's a three-dimensional theory, and I'm simply taking um, two-dimensional boundary condition and coupling two systems together. So there is no holography. Both are um, part of the whole. Um, but there is something holographic that's gonna happen in a second. So in some sense, uh, your question anticipates a very interesting phenomenon that we'll see in a little bit. So let me continue with building ingredients for, for this uh, elliptic genus or half index. So if you take um, a chiral multiplet uh, on a boundary, a two dimensional multiplet, then uh, it's basically uh, inverse uh, theta function. And again, here I write all the contributions, where they come from, and so on. And uh, half of that is uh, what 3D n equals to chiral would contribute if you choose a Neumann boundary condition. So the previous case was Dirichlet, and this one is, is Neumann. And uh, the third ingredient um, that we need uh, to construct uh, basic elements of, of uh, gauge theories, uh, Lagrangian, uh, theories uh, is uh, vector multiplet, which in the case of um, either uh, two dimensions or three dimensional uh, vector multiplet with Neumann boundary condition would act as integral over uh, this fugacity X that measures the charge of the multiplet. So in the previous slides, for example, if I go back to, to this Fermi, it's a complex uh, while fermion, so uh, psi and psi bar carry charges. And that's why X appears uh, in positive power plus one here and negative power minus one here. And uh, you can assemble such matter fields together, but if you have coupling to gauge fields, then you can basically integrate uh, over X and, and this produces the constant term, which counts gauge invariant operators. So this is, by the way, very reminiscent of how singlet uh, vertex algebra is constructed out of triplet algebra that I mentioned a little uh, while ago. Remember, um, singlet is also basically picking out the singlet sector uh, invariant sector out of algebra that has um, SL2 symmetry. So here I'm talking about uh, basic uh, abelian ingredients, so that we are doing something extremely simple. And as a concrete example, uh, let me uh, give you an example of a three-dimensional theory, which is uh, as simple as possible and uses all of these ingredients that I mentioned. So let's construct um, such elliptic genus of a three-dimensional super QED. So it has U1 vector multiplet and uh, two chiral multiplets of charges uh, plus one and minus one uh, with uh, certain boundary conditions. Because of the uh, anomaly in flow, it will be uh, important to introduce uh, churn simons coupling. So with the boundary conditions um, that I, I showed and matter content, uh, we have to take um, Turn Simon's level to be minus one for uh, for this uh, U1 uh, vector multiplet gauge symmetry in the three-dimensional bulk. And if we do so, then basically using everything I told you on the previous slide, we put all these basic ingredients together. We have a single integral over this fugacity X and uh, two copies of the Beheimer symbol, and uh, we get some answer. So first of all, the answer uh, that's written here already looks uh, like a character. In fact, in the CFT literature, this is so-called fermionic form of the character. And um, a priori, it's uh, just uh, an expression in this variable Q, which is same kind of variable that we see in elliptic genus, except that here we have uh, 2D and 3D elliptic uh, genus coupled together. And what's interesting is that even in this uh, most basic simple example, so here is a surprise, uh, this Q series is not just a random Q series, it's a um, character of this logarithmic vertex algebra that I showed you before, namely the one which has central charge minus two and happens to be at the intersection of several different families, um, namely symplectic fermions and, and the triplet VOA that um, I showed earlier. So uh, this uh, algebra, um, so, so this particular character um, 
is um, again a, a Q series, and uh, uh, the algebra has uh, the following properties. So central charge is minus two, so it's non-unitary and it's negative. Uh, it's minimal uh, conformal dimension is also negative. It's minus one eighth. So that also is a sign of non-unitarity because in unitary theories, all deltas would be positive. Uh, but if you compute effective central charge, then um, you find that it's equal to one. So that's a interesting peculiar feature that even though uh, the, the theory is non-unitary, the effective central charge, which is related to growth of coefficients of this Q series is equal to one. So this uh, logarithmic theory that uh, surprisingly came up in the calculation of the supersymmetric partition function is actually related to um, a lattice model, uh, namely a free fermion limit of the six vertex model. Uh, also um, Aztec domino tilings, uh, dimers and uh, various other things. And uh, in this, papers that I mentioned here on the slide, it was recently proposed that uh, such problems have to do uh, or are described um, uh, by logarithmic theory in, in a way which is very similar to um, how we saw logarithmic theories appearing in problems of percolation uh, as described by Cardi and uh, a random walk and various other things that I mentioned earlier. So since lattice models will play a role in uh, some of the remaining parts of the talk, let me remind you a few basic things about uh, uh, this uh, simple lattice model, the six vertex model. It's a model of ice, which um, allows um, oriented arrows uh, on links. So you, we usually think of this model on a square lattice and uh, the edges uh, or links of the lattice are allowed to be oriented in such a way that only two uh, arrows uh, in each vertex are going in and two arrows are going out. So this allows uh, six basic configurations which can be described um, six weights. Uh, and this is what a six vertex model is. <clears throat> in most, uh, studies of uh, six vertex model, one usually takes uh, this um, six weights to be pairwise equal so that there are only three numbers, um, three parameters called uh, traditionally A, B, and C. And um, in that case, uh, the phase diagram of, uh, in this particular slide, the phase diagram of the six vertex model is shown uh, on the bottom of, of the slide. It contains, um, ordered and disordered phases, uh, ferroelectric and antiferroelectric phases, as well as uh, disordered phase. And this phase diagram is um, very similar to um, usual phases that we see in textbooks and perhaps not terribly surprising because basically when strength of some of the coupling becomes uh, very strong, it favors one particular configuration of um, uh, of this orientation of arrows or particle motion in, in other language. And uh, it's kind of easy, uh, there, there are no big surprises here. When you consider generic values of these six weights, uh, then phase diagram is a little bit more complicated, but uh, still uh, same basic structure um, exists and, um, um, and, and uh, it's, it's, it's somewhat similar. So, the problem uh, or, or instance relevant to uh, this Aztec domino tilings and dimers uh, is uh, the dotted line, uh, which is uh, the free fermion um, line off of the six vertex model. So that's the one which uh, has a central charge minus two and effective central charge uh, plus one. So what I showed you, um, just now is that if you study partition functions of supersymmetric three-dimensional theories, uh, you can find um, analog of this elliptic genus, um, um, the half index uh, producing uh, characters of logarithmic CFTs. And uh, this is basically the new connection or one of the new place uh, where characters of logarithmic CFTs appear and um, um, 
provides a window for uh, understanding or exploring this uh, relation better. <clears throat> In a parallel line of development, uh, which um, to which this uh, development uh, based on R metrics and quantum groups at generic values of Q belongs. Um, also, uh, there were new links uh, between um, characters of logarithmic CFTs and invariants of three manifolds developed. And these two lines uh, are not independent of each other. So in uh, string theory or in physics, we know that there is a 3D, 3D correspondence which relates um, three manifold invariants on the one hand and uh, physics of three dimensional N equals two theories on the other hand. So in fact, uh, both of this um, line of developments and uh, even the one uh, related to constructing this new three manifold invariants that I mentioned earlier um, are uh, closely related to each other and in fact were developed in parallel and both of them produce uh, this uh, new interesting connection to logarithmic CFTs which now allows various generalizations and new ways of constructing logarithmic CFTs. So, um, in joint work with Boris Faging, Miranda Cheng, and uh, our other collaborators, we are now uh, finding easy ways to produce many more logarithmic theories and vertex algebras, which were uh, not constructed uh, earlier by by using this um, uh, by using this bridge. But <clears throat> let me um, um, pose a question and. Uh, uh, so here, here is um, an illustration of how, for example, this um, uh, R matrix technique that I mentioned earlier can produce for you uh, the, this a new invariance of three manifolds, which also give you a Q series. Uh, here, there are a couple of examples, one which illustrates uh, that you can uh, take a rather simple knot such as uh, figure eight knot, which is the, the simplest hyperbolic knot and compute this coefficients up to very high order. Um, here I give an example uh, of term Q to the 500. And um, the second uh, example is uh, a rather complicated knot with uh, 10 crossings uh, where I don't give as many uh, coefficients of the Q series, but uh, I provide an answer for, for some um, surgery uh, on, on this manifold, which uh, is a, basically a random garden variety manifold. In both cases, you see that uh, coefficients are integers, so they're definitely counting something, and um, that's actually not too surprising. That's, that's important. They're counting some kind of BPS states and this um, uh, 3D, 3D correspondence context, for instance, that I mentioned. But uh, more interestingly, they produce uh, for you um, many uh, candidates for uh, characters or what could, could be try, uh, what one could try to match with characters of logarithmic VOAs. And uh, they all seem to exhibit uh, one interesting property that the growth of coefficients, uh, which is described by this effective central charge in all known examples seems to be equal to one. Uh, I have no idea why this happens and what's the significance of this fact. So I just pose it here as, as an open question to which uh, I honestly don't know the answer. So the question is why uh, growth of coefficients uh, in all these examples that you can now compute for many three manifolds has to be uh, of this particular type. Or maybe this is not the case and there are counter examples, but I, I'm not aware of such. Uh, a question for uh, Sergey. Yep. So this this same phenomenon also happens for alluvial. Uh, is there a relation between alluvial and the and your logarithmic CFT here? Um, not in any direct way. No. At least that not not that I know of. So in fact, for many of these uh, manifolds, uh, it's easy to compute this. Uh, Q series expressions, and uh, each time you try to find logarithmic CFT uh, that, that has this property and understand it better, you succeed. But this dictionary is still um, largely developed, and I, I don't know an easy uh, or direct connection to Louisville. So that, mm -hmm. that, that, that might actually provide a kind of clue to this question. But uh, uh, Sergey, the CFT of R 
Uh, does it correspond to indeed count in some degrees of freedom or what do you think? Uh, I think the answer is yes. So um, I, I mentioned quasi-particles uh, in this talk and I'll come back to this uh, in, in a second. Uh, I'm not describing uh, thermodynamic bet ansatz for, for logarithmic CFTs, but which also is possible and also requires quite a bit of care. So I think in that context, this uh, C effective uh, becomes a uh, meaningful physical quantity. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sergey, uh, can yeah. I ask a question? S sorry, this is coming from um, somebody who knows next to nothing on knots and variants. Uh, in a previous slide, what is the value? So, what is the meaning of Q from the knot theory perspective? And how does this relate to the Q series that you wrote earlier for the supersymmetric 2D 3D model? Uh, both are good questions. So let me start with the second one. So this Q is the same Q as appears in this uh, 3D supersymmetric theory. So that's uh, again, this magic of 3D, 3D correspondence, which relates non-supersymmetric invariance of three manifolds on the one hand, like the ones shown here, and uh, um, supersymmetric partition functions of 3D supersymmetric theories. And I promise that this, this was the last slide of supersymmetry, so <laughs> I'm not going to talk about supersymmetry anymore. So this 3D, 3D correspondence uh, relates topological invariance in non-supersymmetric context and supersymmetric theories, two, two different things. So that's perfectly fine that they're very different. And uh, from the three-manifold point of view, the meaning of this Q can be understood, for instance, as parameter of the quantum group where it's uh, just a parameter and it's generic. I see, and, and so the, the knot invariant is actually what's important are the coefficients of the polynomial, right? I was just hoping that maybe there is a mathematical or physical intuition for what the actual Q of this polynomial was there is a meaning to it. Like is it, it's a continuous variable, but what does it, what does it enumerate or what does it correspond to? Well, here it's a continuous variable and, and uh, yeah, in this physics language, you can think of it as, as um, for instance, um, variable associated with a shape of the torus. Uh, so in this uh, 3D, 2D couple system, as partition function is defined on a solid torus, uh, modular parameter complex structure of the boundary of that solid torus is tau and Q is uh, exponential of two pi i tau, for instance. So that's, that's one way to think about it. Um, but in, in the context of our metrics that I showed in the very beginning, uh, Q, Q was uh, basically just parameter of the quantum group. And that's taking us as a parameter. Uh, so you may ask whether this observation holds for other gauge groups? Is this only for SU2 uh, or three manifold or all gauge groups? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, I have no clue. I, I never looked at it, to be honest. Uh, so um, that's that's a very good question. In fact, I'm, I'm posing it here because I was a little surprised even by this rank one case. Everything I'm telling you today is about uh, in any context, whether I mentioned lattice models or, or logarithmic CFTs or gauge theories, it's all about rank one. Uh, and even on rank one, I honestly expected this effective central charge or growth of this coefficients to reflect um, a complexity of uh, what physicists call theory T of M3. And therefore I was expecting this C effective to be much more interesting for hyperbolic manifolds. So for instance, uh, some of these surgeries uh, are hyperbolic M3 manifolds. Surprisingly, this doesn't happen. And uh, again, I have no idea why. So it seems that this, doesn't discriminate against uh, ciphered or hyperbolic three manifolds, even in rank one case. So in high rank, uh, to answer a question, again, I have no idea, but uh, one possibility might be that maybe C effective is measuring the rank. <laughs> so I don't know. I see. Thanks. So yeah, I think that'll be, sorry, I think that that's actually quite reasonable if you kind of extrapolate between the, uh, from the Lubio picture to the total theory. And in that case, the C effective is the rank. Oh, excellent. So, but again, then, then, then we need to find connection to Louisville. <laughs> so. I said, okay, uh, I wonder, you know, in terms of physical meaning of this, uh, you know, uh, quantum group parameter Q, uh, because I, I used to think about this like, like in, in terms of like motion in magnetic field. I mean, uh, 
uh, in other examples, right? Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, and it is kind of, uh, in some way, I wonder that maybe, you know, kind of this continuation to logarithmic theory does correspond that you're going from physical magnetic field to something unphysical or, you, you see, when you're going along this queue, I no, maybe it's again not a relevant question, but I still uh, wonder about kind of uh, naive interpretation of queue. Um, so, so I'm not sure I fully understand the question. So may, maybe we can come back to it uh, in the end. I'll, I'll be glad to discuss and see what you have in mind, but okay. I, I'm afraid I don't see it directly. Yeah. No. No. Okay. So, sorry. Uh, right. Uh, so last thing I wanted to mention about this part is that uh, to answer this question, it would actually help a lot to know modular properties of, of this uh, Q series, whether they come from this 2D, 3D couple system or from quantum groups and our matrices. And um, there is a good thing and bad thing about it that we actually can produce this Q series in many examples as I illustrated here, but we have no idea what the modular properties are. And they tend to be of various uh, exotic kinds. So the simplest such kind was proposed by um, Ramano Jan, um, and this is uh, his letter to Hardy uh, from 1920, which was uh, almost 100 years ago, 101. And uh, his letter starts pretty much like uh, many of my emails these days. I am extremely sorry for not writing you a single letter up to now. And uh, then uh, Ramanujan describes this exotic kind of modularity, which he calls mock. And uh, by now, this is an uh, active area of research uh, in uh, modular forms. But, uh, and then many of them uh, do appear as characters of uh, logarithmic theories. And uh, many of them do appear as uh, such uh, Q-series expressions, but uh, this uh, Q-series quickly gets out of the, this uh, territory of mock and produces even more and then even more exotic kinds of modularity. So uh, as a result, um, we don't actually know uh, general modular properties. And again, this is a good thing for studying something new, but this is unfortunately not very good for answering this sort of question. Okay, so by now you have seen uh, some connection or realization of uh, this log CFT elements in, in um, um, three-dimensional uh, supersymmetric uh, theories and connection to topology. And I even briefly mentioned connection to modular forms. Um, by the way, this uh, connection to Luville that, that was brought up in a question uh, also um, is not entirely natural. And that's why you see that question is kind of interesting because uh, here uh, the characters that appear are of very exotic modularity type. So that's, uh, that's another thing to think about if you really wanna take connection to levels seriously. So that's why I don't know immediately the answer to this question. But now in the remaining uh, part, uh, and um, there is not terribly much time left, but luckily I think uh, there is about uh, 20, 25 minutes. Um, I want to come back to uh, this question and um, ask about uh, this uh, quasi-particle interpretation of R matrices. And uh, hopefully you already start uh, getting an idea of what kind of objects this uh, logarithmic uh, theories are, and um, this previous example illustrates that it's very easy to construct them, or relatively easy, uh, as, uh, for instance, 3D, 2D couple systems, which uh, does now operate very much like holography, the way Arkady anticipated it. Uh, namely, we're basically asking for a particular chiral sector of this 2D, 3D chiral uh, couple system, and um, in that sense, uh, the lack of modularity or logarithmicity is basically coming from the three-dimensional bulk theory. And indeed, uh, if in the previous discussion uh, just a moment ago uh, in this 2D, 3D couple system, my three-dimensional bulk is gapped or gappable, then we would be simply dealing with usual elliptic genus of a two-dimensional zero two theory on a boundary, and it would be perfectly modular. There would be nothing logarithmic going on. So that would be uh, 
basically a non-logarithmic story. And logarithmicity here, or lack of modularity, is clearly associated with the coupling to three-dimensional bulk. So now, in the remaining part, um, I want to discuss how to push it back entirely in two dimensions. So in other words, I'm not going to allow coupling to three-dimensional uh, non-compact directions, which provided this lack of modularity <coughs> or logarithmicity. But to answer my uh, or some of the questions from uh, earlier uh, in, in the motivation part, I really want a two-dimensional system uh, which has uh, same kind of symmetries, same properties. And I want to motivate uh, and propose uh, an answer which will be somewhat unusual, somewhat exotic, uh, but my goal will be to justify that uh, this, this um, exotic setup in, in, in two dimensions is really needed to reproduce uh, the, the structures that, that we're looking for, in particular, this R matrices, which have parameters X and Y, such, such as the ones I mentioned earlier. Okay, and uh, since time is short, um, I'm going to focus mostly on uh, the what part of the answer rather than why. So in other words, I'll give you the, uh, I'll describe the class of two dimensional problems, which will be again, exotic and interesting on its own right. Um, and only in passing, I'll mention uh, why this is the right answer or why we believe that this is the right context. So this is the part based on uh, this joint work with Kolle that, that I mentioned um, uh, earlier. And <clears throat> part of the focusing on what is because this is more interesting, this is more fun. And uh, the answer to the question why is in some sense less surprising. So I'll be happy to discuss it uh, in questions afterwards. So this is the part which has to do with uh, systems that exhibit uh, very unusual scaling properties. And as a warm up, let's start with the first example of such system uh, or most well known uh, example um, of an isotropic scaling uh, where time, uh, these are systems where time and space scale differently. So if you perform rescaling by Lambda, then um, uh, and then scale um, space as lambda times x, then um, system may be invariant. If you correspondingly scale tam, time variable by lambda to the power z. So this uh, parameter z is a measure of how anisotropic the system is and is usually called um, dynamical critical exponent of, of the system. So, we are mostly going to be interested in two dimensional systems with such exotic scaling properties, but they exist in many different uh, dimensions. For example, in um, three dimensions or two plus one dimensions. They're also related to quantum dimer models, uh, eight vertex model, which is a generalization of the six vertex model that, that, that you saw in earlier part of the talk. And, um, there are various uh, versions of uh, chiral magnets uh, that have closely related uh, scaling properties or, or uh, behavior. For example, zelashinsky moria model is probably um, the most famous of such three-dimensional magnets and so on. So simple example of a theory which has this anisotropic uh, property is basically uh, a, a scalar field theory, which um, has uh, this Lagrangian, for instance, and two plus one dimensions uh, related to quantum dimers and other things that I mentioned, you can write uh, a scalar field which has time derivative that looks uh, kind of normal and familiar, but uh, spatial derivative, the cost of the energy for the field phi to vary in x direction will be nabla square phi then squared. So. In total, there are four derivatives in this second term. And as a result, if you try to compute a correlation function of phi, you see that in three dimensions, it actually behaves as a log. So this is uh, an example of a log behavior, uh, which emerges from this uh, interesting anisotropic scaling. And I want to make it clear that, that on this slide, my point is not that logarithms appear and that's connection to logarithmic CFTs. Uh, so this is nice feature and, and uh, perhaps it can be 
considered seriously. But the main point of the slide is to uh, illustrate another exotic thing that's going on, namely the uh, anisotropic nature of the scaling phenomena. And that's what I'm going to discuss in the remaining 15 minutes or so. <clears throat> in particular, uh, to answer the questions uh, that I posed earlier in the talk, uh, we will need another version of uh, anisotropic scaling, which is more exotic and very much like uh, in Zemologico's deformation of the Ising model by fields uh, one, two, one, three, and so on, that are symmetric with respect to left and right sectors, one can consider deformations by fields such that their conformal or scaling dimensions H and H bar are different. So these fields therefore carry on zero spin in two dimensional theory. So now I'm back to two dimensional physics and for the rest of it, I'll stay entirely in two dimensions. And this is a little bit more exotic. So such deformations are uh, purely chiral. So they, um, for generic values of this, uh, parameters that here I call lambda, they break parity and time reversal symmetry, and they're kind of exotic. However, they actually have appeared in various systems, and um, I'll give you many more examples uh, with progressive degree of interest or complexity in a couple of next slides. But uh, the way such chiral deformations usually appear in quantum field theory may be familiar, for example, from the study of um, Kadaira Spencer theory. This is probably the most famous uh, example of such chiral deformation. They also appear in uh, C equals one matrix models, two dimensional QCD, uh, chiral pods model, which will be the prototype for uh, various models I'm gonna describe next and various other systems. So this deformation is very similar to um, that deformation uh, of Zamalachikov in the Ising model. In particular, uh, all of these developments that I just mentioned actually are interesting and rich because in each of this context, there, there are infinitely many conserved quantities. So I want to emphasize with the slide that even if we make a chiral deformation of an operator with non-zero spin, then uh, still many of the symmetries, of course, some symmetries of the system will be broken in particular rotational symmetry in two dimensional will be, will be broken because we're considering perturbation by non-zero spin. But I want to emphasize that some of the symmetries are preserved. In fact, many of the symmetries can be preserved. And uh, even if such deformation has non-zero spin, for instance, Zamolochikov's counting argument uh, that tells us about integrals of motion can be generalized and so on. Also, this is the context where you can start discussing RG flows, which was confusing even how to start or how to begin to think about such question in the context of full logarithmic CFT. So here uh, it's maybe a little bit exotic, but still kind of natural. And um, I want to, in the couple of next slides, justify that this is actually quite natural. Uh, so for instance, if H plus H bar is less than two, then you can call this deformation relevant and uh, think about our G flow uh, going to some fixed point. Of course, the fixed point uh, is likely not to have rotational symmetry. And even if it's a fixed point, it probably will have some of this anisotropic scaling behavior. So it will be a Lifshitz type point. But this is still a context where you can start talking meaningfully about RG flows. So deformations of this kind uh, have various uh, appearances or various um, roles uh, and, and we have actually seen some of them. So uh, on the previous slide, I mentioned a couple of systems uh, which are uh, where, where uh, infinitely many symmetries were seeing, but, but they're still maybe considered somewhat exotic. They become a little bit less exotic if you think about holographic duals of such systems, which would be uh, three-dimensional gravity. And if you want to consider chiral deformation, then a uh, natural thing in this three-dimensional holographic duel is to introduce corresponding trans-Simons terms. So um, here is uh, one such deformation, uh, namely of the gravity itself, which is could be viewed kind of universal, uh, which is basically adding a gravitational trans-Simons 
uh, to uh, the usual Einstein-Hilbert action um, with the negative cosmological constant uh, whose scale is set by variable L. So when I was still at Harvard um, or maybe visiting Harvard a couple of years later, uh, I remember um, uh, with Andy Strominger, we uh, took a walk uh, for, to a seminar at MIT. So Andy uh, likes to walk and uh, he proposed that instead of taking the subway, we would just uh, go on a stroll and that's what we did. And during that time, that was back in 2008, I think he uh, told me about a very interesting uh, exotic uh, kind of holographic dual systems, which uh, at least to me, it seemed exotic at the time. And uh, I, as I confessed to you earlier, I didn't think about these questions back then, but um, now it, it's obviously coming back. And systems involve uh, chiral uh, gravity, where in this uh, Lagrangian, you take the extreme limit where Kavish coefficient of Chern Simons term, this gravitational Chern Simons term mu, is such that uh, mu L equals one. So in that case, you see that uh, everything becomes chiral. So basically uh, you lose one of the sectors. In the other sector, uh, what's interesting is that all the states uh, in this case coming from massive uh, BTZ black holes uh, have mass and the spin or angular momentum locked uh, to, to a particular ratio set by the scale of ADS and uh, so on. So this story uh, then has many interesting developments and uh, many of them happened around 2008, 2009, which even led to uh, logarithmic uh, gravity and logarithmic CFTs as a natural spin-off because if one relaxes some of the boundary conditions in the context of this chiral gravity, one quickly runs into a study of holographic duels of logarithmic theories, in particular extreme uh, extremal logarithmic CFT that was discussed um, in the last paper that I mentioned here on the slide. So the upshot is that it's okay to be chiral and we shouldn't uh, fear some of the chiral deformations that, that we saw earlier. And um, as you can probably see, my point here is that anisotropic scaling or a uh, chiral type of scaling is actually a good thing. Sergey, but uh, I wonder, uh, this three-dimensional gravity uh, contains any de uh, dynamical degrees of freedom or it do doesn't? Um, well, that's, uh, here I'm not being uh, specific enough. So I mentioned two systems and they behave a little bit differently with respect to your question. So uh, in the, con uh, so chiral gravity, um, it contains um, some degrees of freedom. So, um, but uh, logarithmic version, uh, which has logarithmically relaxed boundary conditions contains a lot more. So therefore, uh, the, the, uh, the, this question and, and the discussion has to be made a little bit more specific to, to give a precise answer. Okay, thank you. Right. So, <clears throat> Here I'll go back to, to the two-dimensional systems. And again, we'll try to um, describe the stage uh, where uh, some of these uh, types of deformations are appear. And uh, this will bring us back again to, to lattice models with unusual uh, scaling properties. And um, a particular class of models which exhibit this type of or relevant for us type of anisotropic scaling are called uh, chiral clock models. So they go back to work of uh, Oslin and Hughes. And um, this uh, class of models is uh, very interesting. It's, it can be described as uh, classical two-dimensional lattice systems or as uh, quantum uh, one-dimensional spin chains. And I'll briefly mention both. At the, let, at the level of lattice models, they can be described by um, spins uh, that take um, n different values, capital N, very much like uh, in the POTS model that we saw earlier. And <clears throat> they interact um, on a square lattice and they interact uh, by, by usual kind of uh, interaction, except that uh, there is a new feature here 
um, that such interactions are chiral and described by this parameter is delta. Uh, there are basically two deltas associated with uh, left or right or up and down on, on this uh, horizontal vertical direction on this square lattice. And uh, these models become especially interesting for non-zero value of these uh, chirality parameters. If chirality parameter is a zero, then uh, the physics of such systems is uh, relatively well understood. And um, here is a brief summary. If n is relatively small, namely between uh, two and four, then you basically get a second order phase transition between uh, disordered phase and uh, uh, Zn uh, broken ordered phase. If n is larger, then you get uh, a region of uh, critical behavior that gets larger and larger as n goes to infinity. And in the limit of n to infinity, you basically recover the XY model and um, its phase diagram has this um, familiar behavior that we know from textbooks, which has uh, BKT phase transition separating disordered phase and, and the critical phase. When deltas are non-zero, when you add chirality to this um, Zn clock models, things become much more complicated and quite interesting. So even in the case n equals three, which is probably what I'll uh, focus on for, for the remaining slides, uh, there was a big controversy in the literature going on for um, 10, 20, almost 30 years, what exactly happens, what the phase diagram is. And um, aside from um, the, the controversy here is, is uh, related to the structure of this phase diagram where uh, on a vertical axis, I uh, put temperature and, and uh, the horizontal axis labels this chirality parameter. And question is, uh, what exactly uh, is <clears throat> the structure of uh, this n equals three uh, model as far as um, coexistence of several different phases. One phase is the disordered phase. This is very typical. So if you crank up the temperature, you find yourself in a disordered phase. That's not surprising. But then um, if you lower the temperature, you find yourself in gapped uh, ordered phase with uh, Zn long range order. And uh, this is typically a uh, commensurate phase. So this uh, <clears throat> is um, one of the kind of standard or more familiar phases, but then there is also more exotic incommensurate phase uh, denoted here on this diagrams, either I or IC. And this is a kind of uh, spatially modulated phase that appears in this uh, class of models. And the question debated in the literature for uh, 10, 20 or so years was uh, whether um, uh, there is a direct phase transition between commensurate and disordered phase for n equals three, or uh, you can have, you necessarily need to go through this incommensurate, uh, sometimes called floating phase. And the literature on this uh, is quite split uh, or was quite split. So on the right, uh, I list uh, some of the papers that argue that uh, you can have a direct transition from commensurate phase to disordered phase. And on the left, I list uh, some of the papers that argue the opposite. And um, if uh, there is a point where these three phases meet, then there is a Lifshitz point. And that uh, basically belongs to the scenario where um, there is a possibility of a direct transition from commensurate to disordered phase. So this uh, problem was uh, studied uh, by a number of different ways and attacked from uh, many angles. So for instance, even though we're talking about systems which uh, have uh, explicitly broken uh, symmetries such as uh, parity, time reversal and rotational symmetry, uh, one can still study them using RG flows. And this is one of the uh, works um, by Martins and Salis uh, that studied RG flow. And in this case, you can see uh, on the left, a diagram showing a profile of RG flows in the space of couplings. And L, uh, 
the points in the middle is the Lifshitz point. So uh, they argue that uh, there is the Lifshitz uh, point indeed exists. And as a result, the phase diagram should have uh, the form shown on the right where um, there is a direct phase transition between disordered phase and commensurate phase. And uh, this uh, incommensurate phase or floating phase appears as a small region in the middle. <clears throat> These are a uh, couple of other examples of uh, such studies. In this case, uh, both of them are based on the transfer, uh, 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 transfer matrix methods. Um, and uh, one goes back to 1989, and the other is uh, more modern, in fact, from just last year. So comparing these two slides, you can see how perspectives and technology changed in the course of 30 years. And um, both of them basically point to the existence of this Lifshitz point, find a distance away from the uh, POTS uh, critical point at delta equals zero. So delta measures this uh, chirality of the system. In this class of models, there are many integrable lines, or uh, I should rather say hypersurfaces, namely, uh, if you consider um, uh, Boltzmann weights, uh, which are parameterized by various couplings denoted here by kj, and this chirality parameter is delta j, then there are various submanifolds in the space of these couplings where uh, these models are integrable. And this is again rather important for um, <clears throat> connection to R matrices and uh, infinite symmetries and integrability uh, of the QFT that um, I mentioned uh, earlier. Also, I'm yeah. sorry, but uh, this uh, is a function of delta. Delta is like a parameter of the CV, right? It's not like a temperature. That's correct. The uh, delta, yeah, delta is a parameter. So K is basically the usual bond coupling um, that I uh, generically can be, um, without loss of generality, can be chosen to be uh, positive. And um, because we have deltas and, and deltas are also parameters. They describe uh, chirality of the system and they are basically the star of the show or main point of the discussion here. Yeah, but when you're discussing this transition, you know, I, I kind of confuse sometimes transition is a temperature or transition as a function of parameter, which is not of course physically the same, right? I mean- Oh, it's, it's closely related because I see, for instance, uh, uh, Meaningful thing is, of course, only the ratio of uh, parameter K here and temperature. Uh -huh. So uh, varying K is the same thing as varying temperature. Okay. And uh, therefore, K uh, is basically just like temperature. OK, thank you. In fact, maybe some of the plots, uh, yeah, for instance, uh, the plots here, see, they, they actually plots in uh, Z, which is exponential of minus 3K. So that's the same thing as temperature. That's why they look very much like all the other plots which have explicitly temperature in them. <clears throat> okay, so as I mentioned before, this model can be also studied um, as a quantum one-dimensional spin chain. And this was also done by many authors, um, starting with um, Paul Fendley and uh, others. And this became uh, especially popular recently uh, due to experiments and uh, Michel Lukin groups, uh, group uh, that um, studied um, <clears throat> rubidium atoms uh, excited to Rydberg states, which can be programmable to simulate quantum computers and many other cool things. And um, physical uh, phenomena observed in, in the system uh, seem to fall in universality class of this uh, three-state uh, chiral clock model, which is why uh, some of these models became popular. And then in particular, the question of what is the exact phase diagram of these models uh, became very pressing and relevant. So here is a description of uh, these couplings and pictures uh, taken from some of their papers. And these are explicit formulae for this matrices tau and sigma that obey Q commutation relation by third of root of unity. And um, in this system, um, one also finds a phase uh, structure, which is very similar or in fact exactly the same as uh, we discussed a moment ago. Namely, uh, there is strong evidence for direct uh, transition between um, 
gapped uh, disordered phase and uh, commensurate uh, ordered phase and uh, in commensurate phase appears uh, a little away from, from this transition. So in particular, uh, more recently based on all this exciting developments including this uh, real experiments uh, by, by Michel King and his group, um, this model received a lot of attention and uh, even um, from quantum field theory point of view. So you can ask, what is the effective Q of T in a continuum limit that describes this sort of behaviors? And um, again, this was discussed by uh, many groups and many authors, uh, most notably, uh, including Paul Fendley and Subir Sajdev. And here on this slide, I take um, uh, dual Lagrangians or dual actions uh, that are supposed to describe uh, such uh, Zian chiral clock models for small values of n. And uh, they're basically related by a field theory version of Kramer's Vanier duality where uh, phi and psi are both complex scalar fields. And phi is uh, the order uh, parameter in um, original model. Uh, where psi is the disorder variable and vice versa. So even though these two Lagrangians uh, or actions look very similar, they're supposed to be uh, dual to each other. And this is what's discussed in the uh, paper of Witsit, uh, Samajdar and Sajdev highlighted in the bottom of the slide. And in particular using uh, this field theories and uh, renormalization group in the proposed uh, dual action, they indeed argue for direct uh, uh, transition between disordered phase and commensurate phase so that uh, Lifshitz point is part of the phase diagram. So uh, now as we're coming back to this uh, field theories um, and, and uh, their description, uh, you see that the operators that appear here explicitly break uh, rotational symmetry. And they're exactly of the same type um, that uh, we saw earlier when we started discussing this kinds of anisotropic scaling. So this anisotropic scaling may appear uh, a little strange at first sight, but hopefully uh, with variety of examples from different systems, including even holography and, and lattice models, um, it is now a little bit more comforting to talk about such anisotropic scalings and uh, operators in, in field theory that uh, explicitly break rotational symmetry. Uh, Sergey, uh, coming back to this Lagrangian, I wonder uh, that I, uh, what preserves the form of this? Because you have this particular power, of, say, scalar field, for, for, for example. But it's not, it's not like a sigma model where you, your kind of form is fixed, right? So uh, consider the uh, you know, kind of, uh, no, I mean, iteration of the theory, kind of corrections, uh, uh, would it preserve the same form? Well, these are, here each term has its purpose in life and uh, everything is meaningful, but in, um, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. It's, it's no, kind of- consider uh, running. Okay, let's consider the running of the theory. Uh, mm -hmm. I wonder whether uh, new structures would be produced. You see, because you have say, uh, particular power, square, force power, n power, right? But but why you would not get, say, you no know, different power when you start to consider the uh, radiative corrections? Oh, that's a good question. Okay, so now I understand the, the context. Yeah, that's that's a very good question. In fact, uh, that, then I definitely suggest uh, taking a look at this highlighted paper by Witsit Samajar and Sajdev, where uh, they uh, explicitly up to two loop order, analyze uh, the running of the coupling and discuss exactly this sort of question for the second Lagrangian, which is relevant for addressing this, this issue. Right, but that's, uh, that's, that's a very good question. So I don't have time to discuss it in detail, but this paper, in, in, at least in my opinion, does a really good job. Sergey, uh, could you tell us what what is the equivalent of delta, the chiral order parameter? Is this this alpha x? Yeah, that's that's exactly what that's it is. That's the one yeah. that breaks it. Yeah. That, that's the one that breaks it. That's that's the star of the show. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. So I showed you uh, many systems where hopefully now uh, 
you see that uh, such chiral deformations are, they may seem exotic, but they're actually not so bad. And uh, they provide a context where one can actually start talking meaningfully about our, our G flows. And um, many of these theories have solitons, so you can talk about quasi particles. But more importantly for our questions, and again, to circle back to some of the earlier topics is they still may have on various uh, subspaces of couplings, infinitely many conserved charges. So even though we break some of the symmetries, a lot of symmetries may be preserved and the word symmetry here is very crucial. And that's precisely the symmetry exhibited by some of these uh, R matrices and scattering matrices that we wanted to implement in the exotic context. So um, our proposal is basically that these parameters X and Y that you saw in the very beginning are precisely the values of the background fields uh, or anisotropic parameters such as delta as, as you see here. So um, I showed you uh, several uh, new connections uh, of logarithmic CFTs, which are kind of exotic new animals in the CFT zoo to uh, R matrices, quantum groups, three-dimensional physics and physics of uh, anisotropic scaling. So of course there is a lot more to be discovered and I welcome all questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Sergey, for this uh, very interesting talk. So um, um, for any people in the um, audience, please feel free to unmute and ask questions. Okay, um, so to circle back to, um, to connect the last part of the talk with the first. So for the example of this two dimensional uh, chiral model as for instance, the chiral Potts model. Um, so you haven't shown us this part, but do you have an explicit constructions for what the logarithmic CFT that corresponds to it? Do you have the corresponding the Q power expansion or some invariant that corresponds to it? In other words, how far were you able to push the mathematical side of it? Um, like I tried to emphasize in the talk, the goal was in some sense to push uh, uh, the physical side. So mathematical side is uh, in, a in, in a better shape. I'm maybe I was going to say in, in a reasonably good shape, but maybe in a better shape. Uh, in a sense, uh, we have quantum groups, we have R metrics. I showed you the, this explicit form of R metrics in the early part of the talk and even how this R matrices connect as you take Q to root of unity and things like that. So there is a lot uh, known and fairly well understood. The question is um, uh, which um, integrable massive deformations of CFTs realize this R matrices as elastic exact scattering matrices. And uh, the proposal, which again is still part of the work in progress, but, but it's a proposal that you need to consider anisotropic deformations of CFTs. And then, uh, so even though they're anisotropic, uh, a large part of symmetry still survives and includes this quantum group as a symmetry. So that's the part which I didn't discuss uh, because I decided to focus on what rather than why, but um, that in maybe is, is, is less uh, surprising. Mm -hmm. Let's say if somebody's interested specifically about the transition across the Lushitz point in this last example, or what is the, what is the operator, for example, what are the correlation functions going directly from commensurate to the uh, disordered phase? What are the power laws? Are there logarithmic corrections? In other words, do you have specific predictions coming from this more mathematical series specific to the model that you've illustrated at the very end? Yeah, this is a great question. And that's exactly the kind of question that uh, we're at least hoping to answer. I don't know how many of them we succeed to knock out, but uh, that's uh, that's exactly the, the right question. and. Uh, based on uh, what I told you, I want maybe to, to clarify or uh, emphasize that um, the logarithmic CFT uh, here appears, uh, only chiral logarithmic CFT appears first of all. And uh, I'm not fighting this anymore. I'm not trying to make it into full CFT by combining left and right sector. What I'm saying is that just like uh, left sector, the chiral part is realized as uh, part of the 
uh, system describing the, the chiral symmetries. But it, it still, I fully uh, agree with your question. And even in this uh, framework, there should be a way to indeed uh, answer what happens to at least some of the correlation functions and some of the critical exponents. Yeah, yeah that's the goal. Uh, Sergey, uh, I try to return back to this uh, notion of quasi particles or whatever you started from. Uh, I don't know, maybe I, I, I got everything, uh, it's not a correct uh, way I got it. My impression still is that in certain sense, when you're going to this logarithmic series, uh, it reminds something like gravity, which you also mentioned, uh, you know, that where, you know, this notion of uh, normal notion of unitarity, whatever, is kind of, you know, kind of uh, changed, right? Uh, that in this way, if it's some kind of, I don't know, uh, particle or whatever uh, interpretation, uh, it's kind of uh, became kind of very much cumbersome, uh, you know, like a gravity theory. Uh, but uh, no, okay, so I'm just interested in your comments. Uh, so wh what is your feeling about this uh, 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 particle content or, you know, uh, unitarity in this series? Um, well, unitarity is uh, absent in the most general case. Um, and um, um, if even... Uh, Basic symmetries such as uh, P and T, for example, are, are absent. Um, then, um, the but unitarity is not uh, associated with P and T symmetry by itself. You, you right, see? right. Okay, so you can. Uh... I'm, I'm just listing everything that's that's broken. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Um, th 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 that's right. So then, depending on our particular precise context for or a specific uh, problem and question, uh, some of the symmetries may be uh, in slightly better shape than others. For example, uh, in um, connection with um, uh, rubidium atoms, uh, one considers the version of the chiral clock model where uh, P and T are restored. So some of this uh, chirality parameters are still at special values. Uh, in the connection of Carol Potts model um, uh, studied, for example, by Cardi and uh, others that I mentioned uh, earlier, um, one has um, not real uh, Boltzmann weights in this uh, lattice model, but uh, nevertheless, there is a notion of um, uh, unitarity in a sense that one can make sense uh, of Hermitian conjugation and uh, hermeticity and, 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 and so on. Uh, so th th this is maybe just a, a comment that uh, we have to be a little bit more specific about what we want. And some of these issues may become, uh, I mean, they're still delicate, but, but they, they, they may become a little bit more meaningful. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the part of your question about the particle content or... Uh... Okay, no, no, what I'm trying to say is that in certain way, when you mentioned, remember, related to uh, uh, Andy uh, Strominger, that, that it could be, you know, associated with this kind of gravity, uh, then uh, when we are coming uh, this way, then uh, kind of interpretation is changed, right? Because, uh, you know, in, 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 in framework of this uh, uh, gravity interpretation, uh, uh, and then uh, kind of automatically certain stuff would be kind of uh, changed uh, in, in the form, you know, so questions like say part, particle content unitarity could be changed because of this. So, so that's why I ask this. So, so again, what's, what's the question? What's, what? Uh, no, I mean, that, that, what, what that, that, uh, that uh, kind of, uh, 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 extension of the notion like uh, of normal unitarity and normal particle content uh, uh, is changed when you're going to gravity. In, it's what I'm trying to say. Uh -huh. uh, and I'm trying to trace whether there is any connection of this kind. Well, that, that, then again, the, the answer that I just gave about uh, unitarity and other symmetries in, in the yeah, a minute ago is probably the best I can I can say that uh, in 
it, it slightly, first of all, depends on context and what you want. Yeah. And uh, in some cases, there is a way to restore this notion. Mm -hmm. But of course, again, if, if we talk about uh, full generality uh, of zoo of log CFTs and in this uh, mm -hmm. uh, big zoo, in some sense, logarithmic theories uh, will probably be uh, more general members because again, many conditions are relaxed. And uh, in that context, um, they're just non-unitary and I'm not sure mm -hmm. what, what one can do in, in that great generality. Okay, thank you. More questions? If not, well, thanks Sergey again for this very interesting talk. Thank you guys. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you, Sergey.